Welcome to Data Brew by Databricks with Denny and Brooke. The series allows us to explore various topics in the data and AI community. Whether we're talking about data engineering or data science, we will interview subject matter experts to dive deeper into these topics. In this season, we're going to focus on connected health and how data and AI augment and improve our daily health. And while we're at it, we'll be enjoying our morning brew. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate here at Databricks and one half of Data Brew. And hello, everyone. My name is Brooke Wenig, machine learning practice lead at Databricks and the other half of Databrew. And today I'm thrilled to introduce Matt Willis, public health officer from Marin County, at where I'm actually from, um, as well as an avid cyclist, um, assistant coach to the high school mountain biking team at Archie Williams, and has also previously worked at the CDC. Welcome, Matt. Great to be with you. So to kick it off, I know public health officers have been in the news a lot since the pandemic started, but what exactly is a public health officer? Wow, that's a that's a that's a good way to start. So who am I? What do I do? We Every every county in the state of California has, under health and safety codes, uh, a you know, requirement to have a physician health officer. So while it's true that um, health officers are, are more well known over the past two years, it's been that way for decades. Um, and I came into this role eight years ago um, after having been at CDC in the Epidemic Intelligence Service moving to Marin, working in this as a primary care doc. So I'm a physician epidemiologist, as are many of my colleagues across the state. Our job is to um, really ensure the health, well-being, and safety of our residents um, against any number of potential threats. So prior to the pandemic, um, my main focus was uh, in the opioid epidemic. We had been seeing ever-increasing numbers of overdose deaths, increasing rates of addiction, um, and that was kind of the primary focus of our work. And then the pandemic hit, and now for the last two years, I've really been focused primarily on, on COVID-19. Um, we use data. You know, one of the most important tools for us as health officers is to have our hands on the vital signs of our community. You know, that's how I, how I think of it. As a, as a physician, I use data to manage my individual patients, making sure that, you know, their lipids were okay, their blood pressure is okay, their BMI, um, really taking that same philosophy of using a data-driven approach to sort of think about the science, think about the evidence, offer a prescription, offer a therapy to my individual patients and, and extrapolating that to the community as a whole. Um, and so that's where you know, data comes into play for us as health officers and that data is epidemiology. So it's looking at the health of the community across the board, cancer rates, overdose rates, communicable disease rates, which communities are, are, are disproportionately impacted, and designing strategies to make sure that um, everyone is healthy as they can be. And so you had mentioned that every county in California has to have a public health officer. What about other states? Do they have the same mandate? Yeah, it's funny. In the United States, it's it's a, the different ways of approaching public health practice. In, in the state of California, it is very sort of county focused, and you'll know that from our pandemic experience. You might have one county that has a mask mandate and the next one that does not. And that's because many of those policies are derived at the local level. In other states like Florida, it's much more state-driven. state, state driven. It's centralized at the state level. Um, so it's, not, it's, it's, it's different in each place and there's, there's advantages and disadvantages of each approach. Got it. So one thing related to this, what are the trends that you actually see around community vaccinations? Yeah, this is obviously probably our most important single tool when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and limiting um, hospitalizations and deaths is vaccinations. And so this has been our, our most important focus since the vaccines arrived, you know, 16 months ago or so, mid-December 2020. Um, and we've been really focusing on uh, making sure that our vaccines rates are as high as they can be and making sure that no community is left behind um, in that promise and protection that the vaccine offers. So I really look at the trends in two ways. And again, this is just always, always going to the data. Um, what is our overall vaccination rate as a community? And then within that, kind of doing a deeper dive into subsets. So smaller population groups that might be not um, following up, you know, with the with the mainstream is able to accomplish. In Marin County, we are really fortunate um, that we have um, some of the highest uptake of vaccines of any of any county in the nation. Um, we have 250,000 residents 
Uh, we've administered over 600,000 vaccines. Um, that's individual shots. Um, and that places us, we did an analysis a couple weeks ago, looking at across the United States, every county with more than 100,000 people, which is over 2,000 counties in that category. Marin County had the highest vaccination rates of people fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, and interestingly, uh, the other counties in that top 10 of the most highly vaccinated and boosted are Bay Area counties. Six of our, six, six of our Bay Area counties are in the top 10 nationally for that. So um, that's something I think we can all feel fortunate in the Bay Area that we're, we're in, a, in a region that uh, by and large understands the, the value of, of vaccines and has access to them. So well then interrelated with that, like how are these the policies of the county or of the states affecting or impacting the, the vaccination rates from the data, that is? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's one that has been, um, I think, particularly important and, 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 and divisive, frankly, in, in a polarized response across the nation. Um, the role of policy in vaccines is, um, has been important. Um, we're very fortunate that we have been able to achieve the success we have mainly through through a common understanding of the value of vaccines and understanding the, the benefit for us as individuals and for our friends, our neighbors, and those around us um, following the science. So when I think about where I might uh, use vaccine policies as a local public health officer, I, I think about our th three kind of buckets that we look at. One is education. When it comes to promoting vaccines, right, it's education, it's access, and it's policy. And we really only get to policy, if by policy we mean mandates, as a last resort, after we've exhausted those other tools of education and access. And so those are, it's been a very kind of important and explicit strategy for us in Marin. And I think tracking those steps has been really important for um, why we were able to get to over 95% of our residents fully vaccinated before we really invoked any mandates only of in the past two months did i did i use any sort of mandate for for vaccinations um and that was you know one of the hardest decisions i had to make um but we did require that our first responders so our ambulance drivers um, people who are in and out of long-term care facilities our jail guards um, other law enforcement we require that they be fully vaccinated to remain in the workforce um, unless they had a medical or religious exemption um, because we were seeing preventable outbreaks, hospitalizations, and deaths in those settings, and our vaccination rates were not high enough in that, in that particular sector. But that's well less than 1% of our population. So that's an example of how we actually resorted to policy and mandates, but only as a last resort after we had done as much as we could um, in education and, and making sure everyone had access to, to vaccines. And so for those that are familiar with Marin County, they might have had the misconception that it's an anti-vax community. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the data behind that, potentially debunk the fact that Marin County is an anti-vax community? Yeah, that's, it was true. Um, and in fact, you know, famously in, in 2015, we were called out um, when, when the measles outbreak happened. If people remember back the, the Disneyland measles outbreak, um, we in Marin County had some of the lowest vaccination rates against measles of any of any county in the state for for children. There's a required childhood vaccinations, including measles, mumps, rubella. Um, we also had the highest rates of pertussis, whooping cough, which is a vaccine preventable disease, and some of the lowest vaccination rates against pertussis. Um, and so um, Jimmy Kimmel, you know, I think said on, um, on his show that, you know, people in Marin County are, are more afraid of gluten than they are of smallpox. Um, and I was sort of like, you know, touche. Like um, there was this paradox of, of a highly, highly educated community um, affluent. Um, we couldn't, you know, claim lack of access as a reason not to, not to be vaccinated. So when I became health officer, this was one of the most important priorities. You know, I had been at, at the CDC, had been working um, globally, internationally in places where low vaccination rates were due to, to lack of resources. And there were you know, outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases, including in Haiti when after the earthquake, you know, outbreaks of diphtheria in the, in the tent camps because they just didn't have vaccinations. And then moving to Marin County, which is on the complete opposite end of the socioeconomic global spectrum, 
and finding us to be at risk for the same thing, but for a very different reason, um, was, a, was a challenge. And so we, um, we worked as a health department with our pediatricians, with our schools, um, with community members, to really change our understanding of, the, of what vaccines represent for us and really reframing it as a matter of community welfare, welfare community responsibility, and not just purely individual choice. Um, and over that five-year period, our vaccine rates increased from about 75% um, to about 95% for children coming into schools. So we had been um, you know, a more vaccine-hesitant community that the ground changed, I think, even prior to the arrival of the COVID-19 vaccine. So when we had high uptake in Marin, I was less surprised by that than many were because I had seen how the game had changed for us in other vaccines, um, for, for especially for schools. Um, and uh, you know, I attribute um, some of that to some of our community members who, who chose to step forward, especially a young man named Rhett Crowett. Um, and I'll just tell you briefly about Rhett. Rhett was a, a, a child who had leukemia, was unable to be vaccinated, um, was in a public school, um, and um, this was when the measles outbreak occurred. He stepped forward and said, I'm a, you know, it's not safe for me to be in a classroom with other children who are unvaccinated because I could die if I get infected and I cannot get the immunity from the vaccine. And that became a very, very compelling story for us to really put a face to that concept of, of herd immunity or, or community immunity and community responsibility. So that's just one example of the kinds of messages that really, I think, changed our cultural understanding of vaccines in Marin. Yeah, that's so powerful, putting a face and a voice to that. And so as a follow-up, how do you communicate with the community, particularly with those that have very polarized or very um, different views to what we all, or to what the public health officer, public health community believes is best? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it is, you know, the vaccination is a choice, right? So we need to, we need to find a place where... Um, people trust um, trust us. I think ultimately so much of this comes down to trust. And how do you build trust between public health and the community? Um, I think one of the one of the key strategies for us was to be as transparent as we can in terms of what we know and what we don't know, um, to have a lot of open communication and maintain open dialogue. Um, in that first bucket, you know, education, access, and policy, that education is importantly bi-directional. So, you know, the default idea of education would be that you as a public health officer have your, your pulpit or whatever, and, you, and you, you, you talk about the safety and efficacy of vaccines and show data. That doesn't work very well, actually. I mean, for some, that's, it's, certainly, it's certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, what we really need is to listen as much as we talk, I think, and to hear people's concerns and to demonstrate um, that we can relate to the dilemmas in people's everyday lives around these decisions and meet them where they are. Um, so that's the, I think, one of the critical elements of education is that it's, we are educating ourselves as healthcare providers and as public health at the same time as we are offering education to our community. Um, and that act of listening um, both builds trust in itself, but it also allows us to be more precise in our messaging because our messaging is actually aligned with what people are actually concerned about. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think that's the, I think it's probably the most important, you know, that, that's the most important strategy for dealing with, with the polarization. It's just getting, you know, not, not condescending to people, not shaming people, not making people feel defensive because they will never change their, their hearts or minds when, when that's their, their, their attitude. Do you feel that politicians, like what role should politicians play in public health? Because perhaps... The fact that politicians did get involved tended to make it more polarized, and so people were less empathetic. I'm curious, especially from you, you were sitting in the middle of it, so yeah. Yeah, we're fortunate. You know, we were in a in a in a bubble in some ways, and when I was looking at what was happening, you know, back east and other parts of the country, um, I mean, not that it was easy here, but we were really fortunate in that our politicians, you know, by and large, were supportive of public health practice and leadership. Um, 
I do think that you know there, there's, there are important roles for politicians. The answer is not for politicians to simply step aside. You know, politicians are elected to represent the people. Um, there are some checks and balances there. Um, I think when we get into trouble, it's when politicians are um, using sort of a super t superficial understanding of the science um, and then um, making recommendations or declarations or laws um, that don't actually agree with what scientific reality would determine. You know, face covering is an example, vaccinations are an example. These are, these are tools that are important for protecting our residents. Um, and that, the fact that that space got politicized, I think it really set us, set us back. I'd love our politicians to be much more active in, in ensuring that we have the resources we need. Um, you know, testing, you know, we didn't have enough testing. Or, you know, early on there was lack of vaccinations. Um, you know, the politicians, you know, I, our, we're fortunate locally to have our political leaders really help support access to those resources, but I think we needed, we needed more advocacy, more resources federally at the state and at the local level for, um, for the infrastructure, for the public health infrastructure to respond. And so I know that there's a lot of policies around mask mandates, vaccination status, and all of that's kind of changing right now, in part because of the low COVID numbers. But I know a lot of people are doing at-home tests, a lot of things aren't getting reported. And so I'm just curious how you're planning to make upcoming decisions with new surges, new waves, with a lack of access to data. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, our, as the pandemic evolves, the data sources we need to look to also change. Um, I was just talking with our epidemiologist this morning. Um, we are seeing a greater fraction of our cases now coming in through antigen testing that's performed at home than through PCR testing that's performed in laboratories. So kind of the, you know, the basic idea of just how, much, how active is the virus in our community, you know, up until very recently was, you know, PCR tests coming from laboratories and we had these data streams that were coming and I could look at the numbers each day and say, okay, this is how active the, the virus is. That's really no longer the case uh, because a, a smaller and smaller fraction of people are actually going to the, you know, the, the clinic to get that PCR test, going to a lab and then sending the results to public health. So we're looking to other sources um, to answer that question of how active is the virus. Wastewater is a really promising new tool for us. Uh, in Marin, we had been really active in, in using wastewater early on and we were able to, to really see and, and validate that, that, that the wastewater levels really correspond very well to case counts. When we knew the case counts were more accurately capturing true transmission rates. And so knowing that, now we can continue to use wastewater um, moving forward, knowing that the window around case counts is actually less less precise. So we have four sites in Marin, and uh, you know all, all across the across the nation, there's more and more infrastructure using it wastewater. You know the joke on my team is that poop don't lie. You know it's like it's everybody. You know the poop don't lie. It's uh, it's upstream, so to speak. It's it's an entire catchment. You know whole community that might have you know a certain like a sewer shed they call them. Um, and you can measure the amount of virus particles actually as a matter of concentration within that sewage. Um, and it, it really accurately determines, you know, tells you how much, how much transmission is happening, how many people are infected, not necessarily numerically how many people, but what is the burden, the viral burden within that community. Um, and it tracks closely again to case counts. That's super interesting, finding that correlation between wastewater and COVID cases. And so I'm curious now as a next step, are we entering in the endemic stage of the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's important not to get too hung up in the semantics there, um, you know, because at the end of the day, we have, you know, we have a virus that um, is, is traveling through our community. I think we, you know, we recognize that whether or not you call it pandemic or endemic, it's going to be present. Um, the, you know, endemic diseases don't necessarily mean they're they're benign. It's they can be you know they're common, um, but like flu is you know an endemic disease, but causes thirty thousand deaths approximately annually in the United States. You know worse more on, a, on in a bad year. Um, so calling it an endemic disease doesn't necessarily mean that we can abandon the measures we use to to, to control and protect ourselves. I think to me the value of that shift would be to sort of have a new psychological relationship with the virus, to understand that this is part of the world that we live in now. 
um, and, that we, and, and feel reassured that we have tools to manage risk in our own individual lives and at the community level, um, and that we'll track using the data, we'll track the transmission rates, and we can flex into those tools depending on what's happening at any given time um, from a more sort of ongoing, sustainable, endemic relationship with SARS-CoV-2. Um, but I sometimes hear when people say endemic, it sort of feels like synonymous with over. <laughs> and I think that's, that's an oversimplification, unfortunately. I think this is a, this is a virus that's gonna be, be with us you know, forever more. So this is really interesting, Matt. So I did want to actually ask the question, though, like, what do you think about the dropping of the mask mandates for air travel and transit that just actually recently happened? I'm just curious for your opinion as a public health officer. Yeah. Well, first off, my personal opinion, you know, if I were traveling, I would continue to, to cover my face. And my, my mother-in-law is coming out for our son's high school graduation and uh, definitely counseling her to continue to cover her, you know, her face. She's 80 years old. So, um, you know, the, I, I think it's clear that transmission, you know, that there will be increased risk associated with travel if, if everyone around us is not covering their face. So if you picture a six hour, you know, transcontinental flight um, where you're sitting shoulder to shoulder with people and they're not, their face is not covered. If that person is infected and they're not covering their face and you're not covering yours, your risk is higher than it would have been if both of you were covering their faces. So um, it's important to acknowledge that um, this decision does increase risk. I think it's, um, it's also being done for this, this question we just talked about in terms of pandemic or endemic, you know, we also know from a quality of life standpoint that we don't want to be covering our faces forever into the future. And that there is a point at which it's no longer necessary to mandate that. My opinion is that this is, um, you know, a, a premature um, in terms of that point. You know, we are seeing with the BA2 variant, we're seeing more transmission. I think the coming week will, will really um, show us in the Bay Area and, and probably across the nation that BA2 is really getting a foothold. Um, we're seeing, you know, pretty dramatic increases in cases, you know, fortunately not hospitalizations yet, but we are seeing cases. So it, it's, you know, the timing of this, I think, is, um, is unfortunate. Um, but I understand what's behind it. I think it's also part of what we talked about in terms of the politicization of this of this whole pandemic response. Um, we issued a statement as soon as the federal judge came across, um, and then that it was clear that um, you know the state of California was trying to determine where their what their ruling is for the state. And right now, it's 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 ambiguous from a legal standpoint right now what the state of California can or cannot do given that this is a, a federal ruling. So that's where we are right now. But in that ambiguity, I wanted to be clear with my with our residents that we still recommend that people cover their faces even if they're not obliged to in the course of travel. Um, and, that, and that stands, especially for people who are at higher risk for um, you know, severe illness and death if, if they're infected. Wearing a KN, KN95 mask that protects the wearer more than you know, just the, the surgical mask um, I think is an important step to take um, for our older residents who are traveling. And we want people to be able to have that experience of travel. Um, you know, I took a trip recently and loved the fact that I was able to step out of the, you know, COVID cave for a little while and kind of um, be, be renewed and, um, and, uh, and travel is important. But I also think there's ways to do it safely. And covering your face isn't that big a deal, really, if it comes down to it. It's a really, relatively simple intervention that you can take. Um, and it does have, um, it does have some protection, not as much as vaccines, mind you, right? The, that if I have one, if we're going to pick one thing, it's, it's, it's vaccinations, but, but masks are also an added layer of protection and why not take that, that measure? That uh, makes sense. And, uh, related to that, uh, do you find from the data that the, the, um, boosters are actually helping with these new variants as well? Yeah, the booster dose, the first booster is important. Um, you know, the, you know, it's gotten it's gotten more confusing for the public as as we roll out kind of more different phases of the vaccine. We have the second booster dose now for people age 50 and above or chronic conditions. Now we're talking about the first booster dose for children age 5 to 11 will be coming on board. And then the, like the first vaccine for 0 to 4. So there's all these different cohorts and groups and different stages. Um, 
but at, you know, for the forest, for the trees, really moving from being fully unvaccinated to vaccinated is the most important single step. Like if you are not vaccinated, getting vaccinated with that first series is by far the biggest benefit. Um, and then for people who are fully vaccinated, getting that first booster is also important um, because that does boost your immunity. I think if we look back, you know, if we'd had more time in, the, in Operation Warp Speed where we moved remarkably quickly to getting these vaccines out into the world, you know, it's a lot of, you know, if, if they had actually done studies where they did three vaccines versus two, it's probably, it probably would have been a three dose regimen actually. So I, you know, I think about that first, that first booster as being really important to full protection. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm less, you know, I think the, the second booster for people above age 50 is more kind of up to the, you know, up to the individual, talk to your doctor. Um, it may be right for you, especially if you're at higher risk for a bad outcome, but we're not recommending it nearly as strongly as we are that, that first booster dose because it does, it does have protection against, against the emerging variants. And so in the midst of the COVID pandemic, one thing that often didn't get enough attention was all of the opioid epidemic as well as opioid and drug overdose related deaths. Can you talk a little bit more about what that's what the data has behind that, what your outlook is. I know you've co-founded SafeRx Marin to actually help with the opioid epidemic locally, but can you talk about it both locally and nationally? Yeah, um, I think when we talk about moving from you know pandemic to endemic, to me this is one of the one of the benefits of, of sort of claiming this as an endemic ongoing um, challenge for us. You know, SARS-CoV-2 because it will allow us to move out of that sort of pandemic emergency frame. And, and see it as being next to other public health challenges. And that's, the opioid epidemic is something that has been neglected because of COVID-19 and necessarily so, right? We really did need to focus on saving lives with this new virus, but it's important to change back now to, to really see a more holistic understanding of all the public health threats. And that's where I see opioids as really being an important priority for us moving forward. Looking at the data in Marin County, uh, I just, did this analysis last week and was really alarmed to see, you know, I had a sense that this was this occurred, but not 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 to the degree to which opioids were were really continuing to harm our community. In Marin County, anyone of under age sixty over the past two years, ten times more likely to have died from an overdose than from COVID nineteen. Anyone under age sixty, and if you think about all the you know, the work hours, the time, the, the societal interest and focus on, on COVID-19 compared to overdoses, there's really a mismatch there. And so I think it's, this, is a, this is an invitation for us to, to refocus on things that are, um, the data t you know, tells us are in fact as pressing um, in the next stage. So we're fortunate that we've had this coalition going in Marin, there's a variety of coalitions like it. Across the across the state, they bring together law enforcement, educators, you know, our school community, public health, healthcare providers, um, elected officials. Really, it's a complex overdose, and the opioid epidemic are, is a very complex problem, um, and it requires um, it requires strategies that cross sectors to come together to really design a single solution, and that's what the um, that's what those coalitions are designed to do. They're designed to create infrastructure for people who normally don't talk to each other, um, but are facing the same challenges um, to come up with common strategies. Perfect. Well, okay. So we're going to switch gears just a little bit to make things a little bit lighter. But as an epidemiologist, um, I'm just curious, what are some of the coolest or the funnest analysis that you've done, actually? Yeah, I mean, public health... It, is, is I think is the funnest like application of data. Like we, you know, we get to use data to really change things um, and save lives. Um, you know, and so I love, you know, I love having my hands on, on, on data that, that it can immediately turn around into strategies that, that protect people. And that's kind of what we do. So, um, and there's been a few chapters, I think in my career that it really stood out. One was, was um, in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, where uh, you know there was hundreds of thousands of people who were displaced uh, from their homes in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, after the after the earthquake, and they moved into into tent camps 
basically you know the, all the all the structures there are these concrete cylinder blocks and they and they not seismic in any way and they you know almost all just collapsed so people you know that night you know if they had survived and you know more than 100,000 did not you know we had very quick early mortality but the rest needed to needed to find places to live and so they set up these makeshift tent camps in any sort of open field across the region and those places became obviously at high risk for outbreaks of communicable diseases um, because there was there was not plumbing, there wasn't proper hygiene, um, and and so we moved clinics, you know, healthcare, you know, Doctors Without Borders and other organizations moved into those sites, and we I was able to go down to to Port-au-Prince and help establish a surveillance system for outbreaks of diseases in the tent camps, working with the medical providers in those camps where they would send us each day just basic data of hash marks of different diseases they were seeing, respiratory illness, malaria, diarrheal illness at each camp. And then we would crunch the numbers at the embassy in the evening um, to try and determine where outbreaks were occurring so that we could intervene. Um, and it was that system that ultimately detected the cholera outbreak that occurred in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake. Um, and, other, and, and malaria, we were able to get anti-malarials out to places where malaria is more active. Um, and it was just a really clean um, and direct application of using data for, for public health. I think that was my, my favorite initiative. And how does the data get stored or transmitted across these various agencies as well? Because like I imagine you're crunching the numbers, you might be running something locally, maybe on Excel, but then how do you report that data back out elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, just the technical aspect of it was important. Um, we also, you know, just getting people to report data, I think was the first issue. Um, you know, anyone who's interested in data always knows you've got to, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Like, you've got to start with the right stuff. And so um, I spent a lot of time, you know, moving around Port-au-Prince on the back of a motorcycle, kind of going to these clinics and saying, this is what we need. You know, the last thing these docs wanted to do at the end of a long day of taking care of patients in these, it was to, like, fill out a form for the CDC. <laughs> so we needed to sort of take a realistic approach to that. Um, and then we're using, you know, Excel. I think we were using just, you know, this was very basic stuff, you know. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, proportional contribution of different diseases. So, you know, in a given area, it used to be only 10% was malaria. Now it's 30% of the things that are being seen in that particular setting are malarial. So we'll see that as a trigger for uptick in malaria incidents. Um, and then it's through communication. We had weekly meetings. Um, all the NGOs would get together in person. Um, at a golf course um, and uh, you know, a clubhouse of a, of, a, of a golf course that was a giant tent camp um, and review the data. And then people were on the internet. I mean, there was, there was email and there was, there was some informational infrastructure where we could communicate the findings um, and sort of dispatch our, our resources to the right places. Wow, that is some amazing work that you've taken part of. And so before we close out our session, I would love to ask you, cyclist to cyclist, what is your favorite bike route in Marin? Oh my gosh. That's like asking someone to like pick their favorite child. Um, if they... <laughs> I, I mean, it depends. I guess it depends on the day and the bike. I have a, you know, I have a, I have a gravel bike and I have a mountain bike and I have a road bike. So, um, you know, for road riding, I love to go out to West Marin, you know, that just that loop out to Point Reyes Station and, and a stop at, you know, bakery for the, for the, the calorie, calorie neutral ride, you know, <laughs> burn calories out there, eat a giant something. And then, and then I like, I like riding up Mount Tam. I, I live in San Anselmo um, and, and Phoenix Lake and Eldridge Road is, is close to where I live. And that's a really, and it just helps me to be at the top of Tam and kind of looking out across Marin and sort of thinking about the community that, I, that I'm that i serving um, and see everyone in their place and kind of recognize that that's the level that I'm functioning as a public health officer is really seeing the community as a whole. And having that perspective physically actually helps me, um, helps me see things more clearly. That's truly inspiring. I love mountain biking on Mount Tam as well, though I don't quite have that same feeling of looking over everyone that I'm protecting or looking out for as the public health officer but I just find it's a great way to reset and clear my mind. Uh, my personal favorite loop is Alpine Dam. Oh, spectacular. I think we did that ride together. We did. It was such a fun ride. Well, Matt, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to educate us all on public health, 
the role poop plays in policy, and your outlook on the pandemic and endemics. Great talking to you.